Hey guys, welcome back to what I think will probably be the final installment of the Game Boy Zero Guide. Today we're going to be putting it all together and tying up all our loose ends. We'll finally be mounting the Raspberry Pi in the cartridge reader. We're going to take apart a USB hub and wire that up to our Teensy and our external USB port. We'll add our power boost, which is what will charge the battery and allow everything else to run off of the battery. We'll mount the audio filter board that we made last time and wire it up to the amplifier and a volume wheel. And then after connecting a few things on here like the power switch and the micro USB charging port, that should be about it. So if you're ready to finish this up, let's get started on part 6 of the Game Boy Zero Guide. So this is the power boost board. What this does for us is it lets us charge the battery which gets plugged in there. There's a micro USB port for charging input, but we're not going to be using that. We'll be using this USB pin right here, which will be connected to our micro USB charging port. Then these pads here are meant for attaching a USB port, which it comes with, but we're not going to use. Instead, we're going to connect directly to these pads that the USB port would have been connected to. We'll hook those up to the power strip that we made. And then the last thing that we're going to use is this enable pin. This is what's going to be connected to the power switch. This thing can get pretty warm when it's charging. And if you look on Adafruit's website, they say that that's normal. But since it gets pretty hot, I wouldn't put any hot glue on the middle here. I would stick to putting just a little bit on the corners to mount it. And then this is the battery that I'm using. It's a 2000 milliamp hour lithium polymer battery that I got from Adafruit. It gives me between three and four hours of playtime. But a word of warning about these things, these can be pretty dangerous. You have to make sure not to puncture this or tear the casing or crush it or bend it or let it overheat. So that means you probably don't want to have it pressed up against the power boost since that'll be getting pretty warm. You absolutely have to make sure that these two wires don't short, meaning the metal parts touch each other. You just have to be really careful. You can look on YouTube and see lots of videos of these things bursting into flame and exploding. So if you've never messed with something like this, I would recommend seeing if you can find someone who has done this type of thing before or is comfortable with working with it and see if they can help you. Just be really careful guys. Please don't burn your house down or anything. Alright, so let's go ahead and wire up and mount the power boost. My first build, I wasn't very happy with where I put it. It was actually just kind of floating here in the battery compartment. And I just had to kind of push it out of the way and fit the battery in there. And I just wasn't very happy with that. The only reason that I had done it that way was so that I could easily unplug the battery if I needed to. So I'm going to do it a little bit different this time and mount it up here. There's quite a bit of empty space up here, which is just the right size for the power boost. Plus, it'll be right next to all these wires that we need to connect to it anyway. So again, the only disadvantage of putting it up here really is that you can't easily unplug the battery if you wanted to. You'd have to take apart the Game Boy to do that. If you're gonna mount the power boost up here, you definitely wanna make sure that the back of it can't come in contact with this metal shielding plate right here. Now you can use a piece of electrical tape for that, but for something like this that's gonna be charging a battery, I like to use something a little bit more solid. I find that a piece of perf board works great for this. Alright, so once again, I've got the power switch hooked up to the enable pin right here. Micro USB charging is going to the USB and ground pins. And then one of the USB power outputs is going to the external USB port here. Before you wire this up, by the way, you should probably take your multimeter and double check to make sure that these two wires aren't shorted and these ones aren't shorted and that the switch is behaving as you expect it to. Again, the switch is a little counterintuitive when it's to the left from this perspective, meaning that it's off, you want these two wires to actually be connected because we'll put the enable pin to ground, which will turn off the system. So anyway, just before you wire everything up, double check with the multimeter to make sure that everything's connected how you're expecting it to be. When you're ready to go ahead and test it, make sure your switch is on and then plug in a micro USB cable. So that's a good sign. You can double check that your switch works. And if all that checks out, go ahead and connect the battery all right, and then the last thing that we need to test is make sure that it charges the battery. And there we go. Looks like we're all set, so we can go ahead and mount this to our perf board here. For the USB hub, it doesn't matter too much what brand you get. This Targus one is just one that I had on hand. I'm sure you can find cheaper solutions that'll work just fine. The most important thing, though, is just to make sure that it's small enough that when we take it apart, it'll actually fit inside the Game Boy case. So you can see there's not a whole lot to these things. There's a controller chip, a few resistors and capacitors on here, but the bulk of the volume is really taken up by the USB ports themselves. So what I did on my first Game Boy Zero was I cut off this port just to make it a little bit smaller, 
desoldered two of these and wired this one up to the Teensy and this one up to the external USB port. And that left me one free to plug in Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or anything like that. We'll connect the data pins, which are the green and the white wires, directly to the Raspberry Pi, and then we'll power it by hooking it up to the power strip that we made in one of the earlier guides. Now removing the actual ports can be kind of a pain. One option that you have is to cut these flush with the board like we did the cartridge reader. And then on the other side, that'll leave some pins that you can solder wires to really easily. Alright, so as you can see, kind of a pain to remove. But, by removing them, we can save a lot of space inside the Game Boy case. So these are the data wires that will be connected to our Raspberry Pi. So what we can do is temporarily wire up 5 volts and ground directly to the Raspberry Pi to power it. And then the white and green wires will be connected to pads 22 and 23. 22 will be the green wire and 23 will be the white wire. And then pad number one here is five volts and this is ground. So we can just wire it up and test it real quick to make sure we didn't damage anything. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and mount the Raspberry Pi and the cartridge reader. So it's a good idea to go ahead and test out a few things before we do that. You probably want to test out the Teensy, make sure all your controls still work, and test out the screen one more time. You can check out part 3 of the guide to see how to wire up the screen so you can test it. The only difference being that you can use these two wires going to your power strip instead of the power wires that are connected directly to the controller board. Now as for testing the Teensy, we'll be connecting wires to these pads here on the back to connect it to our USB hub anyway. So you can go ahead and do that now to test it out. This one right here is 5 volts. This will be the white wire, the green wire, and this will be ground. Now if you've been paying really close attention, you may have noticed that I've moved a few things around just a little bit. For instance, I had to scoot the controller board up just a little bit. I had to move the Teensy over this way a little bit to make room for the power boost on the other side of the board. And just fair warning, you may have to wind up doing that as well. It actually sounds a lot worse than it is though, because moving anything that you've mounted with hot glue is actually really easy to remove. You can either heat it up with the tip of your hot glue gun, or just slice through it really carefully with a fresh X-Acto knife. Just obviously be careful, make sure you don't cut any wires or anything. All right, so hopefully you were able to test out all the major components, make sure that everything still works, because now we're actually gonna mount the Raspberry Pi and the cartridge reader. These pegs here get in the way when we try to put the two halves of the case together, and they were only really there to hold it in place when it was attached to the motherboard. So we're gonna go ahead and cut those off. Another issue that I forgot I ran into with the first one is that this screw head winds up being too tall and won't let us close the case. This other one is fine though. So what I did was shape down this part and just skip the screw on this side and use a little bit of glue to hold it in place. Now for the Pi itself, you obviously want to make sure that nothing here on the top of the board can come in contact with any of the metallic bits on here. So just go ahead and cover that up with some electrical tape. I don't think it would actually be able to touch the screw that was right here, but just in case. The biggest thing with actually placing it is just making sure that the HDMI port is lined up just right with this. You also want to make sure that there's enough room on this lip for you to put it back together though. So at first just put a couple of little dabs on there just to hold it in place so you can make sure that everything still lines up right, which that looks good. And we'll come back and reinforce this a little bit later on. Now like I mentioned earlier, we're not going to put a screw in on this side because it'll wind up bumping into the Raspberry Pi on the other side. So instead we'll just put a little bit of glue underneath here, but you don't have to worry about it moving around too much because it still has this peg right here holding it in place. 
this point you probably want to put both sides of the case together to make sure that everything actually fits with the way that you have it arranged. So after filming that last part I realized that I forgot about this guy right here. We're going to need to trim down this lip right here if we want to be able to access the HDMI port. That's better. Alright, so assuming you were able to put it back together alright, then now we're going to go ahead and reinforce this a little bit better so that it'll stay in place whenever we plug in an HDMI cable. Now just to point out, when the case is closed, this will be pressed pretty well against the front side of the case. So all we're really doing here is reinforcing this so that when you push in on it with an HDMI cable, it won't slide back. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and hook up my USB hub now. I'm going to have the external USB port connected to these pins, and my Teensy is going to be connected to these pins. This one's going to stay empty in case I want to plug in a Wi-Fi adapter or Bluetooth or anything like that. Now I'm going to connect the power pins to the power strip that we made. In hindsight, that probably would have been easier to do first, but oh well. Okay, so double check your wiring. Make sure that everything's going where it's supposed to go. Make sure there aren't any unintentional shorts or anything like that. And then when we mount it, we're going to put it right about like this. So it's nice and low profile, and through the battery compartment, we'll have access to this USB port. Just like everything else that we've been mounting, you don't want anything on this part to come in contact with any metal down here. So we'll go ahead and put some electrical tape across this side before we mount it. Now we're going to wire up all our audio components and add a volume wheel. This is one that I got from Radio Shack. It's a 10k ohm potentiometer. You can try and use the one that was on the Game Boy itself, but I found that those older ones typically aren't in very good shape. They might have dead spots in them. It might make popping or hissing noises as you adjust the volume. So even though it doesn't fit as nicely, I prefer to put a new one in there. So the pins on this one from Radio Shack, this bottom one is ground. This is the right channel input. This is the left channel input. This is left channel output, and then this last one is the right channel output. Since I'm only doing mono sound for my speaker and headphones, I'm only going to need one of those, so I'm just going to use the ground pin, right channel input, and the right channel output. It's going to be positioned right about here, but we can't connect our GPIO pin directly to it. We need to have our low pass filter that we made in the last guide between the GPIO pins and the potentiometer. We're going to position this right about here. You notice there's all this empty space on the other side. We're going to go ahead and take advantage of that and make sure that our filter lines up with that. So we'll have the GPIO sound output go to the input on this filter. The output of this filter will go into the potentiometer, and then the output from this will go to the input of the amplifier. We're also going to need to connect a couple of ground wires to both the filter and the potentiometer. This six one down on the outside is GPIO pin 18. This is what's giving us audio output, assuming that you configured it the same way that we did in the last guide. And then the third one up from that one is going to be our ground connection. So these are the input wires from our amplifier. This one will go to positive and this one will go to ground on our volume wheel. So the volume wheel is going to sit right here, right where this lip is, but we need something underneath it to support it. So again, I'm going to use a little piece of perf board for that. And you'll definitely want to cover up the bottom of this with some electrical tape. If there are any particularly sharp parts that stick up very far, you may want to trim them down as well. And at this point, it's a good idea to go ahead and put it together again, just to make sure that all this actually lines up. Assuming that worked and you can still close your case, we'll go ahead and wire everything else up to the Raspberry Pi. We'll connect our screen right here like we did in the third video. We'll connect the power right here to pads 1 and 6. And then we'll connect the USB hub 
right here. Now, a word of warning about connecting the USB. This pad here, 23, is incredibly close to the leg of this USB port, meaning it's super easy to accidentally short it, and I've done that several times. It doesn't seem to actually damage anything, but it does seem to make it so the USB doesn't work. So if you're scratching your head wondering why your hub isn't working, double check that, because like I say, it's super easy to accidentally do that. Now you're gonna to wanna to trim all these wires down as short as you can get them, especially on the display connector, because it can reduce the amount of noise that you'll see in your screen. And then another nice thing is it just saves some space inside your case. Okay, now we'll wire up our L and R buttons to the Teensy. Those will go to pins 10 and 11, and then we'll also use this ground pin here. Now all that's left is to connect our power strip to the power boost. They're going to be connected here, right below where our external USB port is getting its power from. I'm going to go ahead and mount the buttons for our screen right here. If you do that, just make sure that you don't cover up this screw hole. Now even if you have everything laid in there exactly how I showed you, it's going to be really tight when you try and close it up. So if you're having problems closing it up, which I actually am, a good place to start is cable management. You can use little dabs of hot glue as you've seen me doing to lay stuff out as neatly as possible, make it lay as flat as you can, and that should help. As you close it up, you may have to kind of guide these wires that are connected to the SD card pins to go into this empty space here. And like I say, it is really tight. I mean, this thing is, there's no room in there. <laughs> so if you're having trouble getting it to close all the way, just keep trying, keep adjusting stuff, moving stuff around slightly if you need to, because uh, it is possible. So hopefully you were able to get it to close all right. Once you do, go ahead and test it out, but first without the battery, just to make sure that everything works. If everything checks out, you can go ahead and plug in your battery, and you can tuck the wire behind the cartridge reader like this. Pull the battery out the back, and then close it up again. And believe it or not guys, we're done. So like I had said a while ago, I wasn't even planning on doing this guide, uh, but here we are, start to finish how to make your own Game Boy Zero. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, be sure to subscribe. I'll be doing more projects like this in the future. If you're gonna try making your own Game Boy Zero, be sure to stop by the forums. There's a bunch of really helpful, nice people there. And if you have ideas for projects that you'd like to see in the future, let me know in the comments below. I've got a few lined up. I'm probably going to pick a little bit easier one for the next one just to give myself a little bit of a break. As for the winner of this one, which I know everybody's been waiting for, it's going to someone named Matthew in California. So I've already made contact with Matthew just to make sure that he was actually eligible and in the United States and all that good stuff. But congrats again, Matthew. I'm going to be testing this out over the next couple of days and then I'll send it out to you. Well, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.